Just for anybody who's wandered in off the street by mistake, I just want to do a quick <laughs> reminder of what the MIT Media Lab is. I mean, it is just one of the world's great centers for innovation and creativity. It's given us, gosh, you know, the e-ink in your Kindle display, one laptop per child, the scratch programming language that my daughter spends most of her life on, Lego Mindstorms, and just a whole bunch of really foundational technologies. It's a remarkable place. And its director, Joey Ito, is a remarkable guy as well. Um, I've been Google stalking you. Uh, at, at various times, a journalist, futurist, activist, tech evangelist, venture capitalist. I know it seems like I'm rapping. And this year, Joey published a book, Whiplash, which bills itself as a survival guide for the future. And uh, I strongly recommend everyone reading it. What is less well known is that Joey began his creative career here in Chicago. And you know, this venue was one of the places where he played. And the music you were listening to as you came in was actually a selection of tracks that Joey used to spin. So tonight we're going to hear about Joey's unlikely journey from DJ to director, from Metro to Media Lab, and also try and pull out some lessons about creativity. So uh, welcome, Joey. As a wannabe DJ myself, how, how did you end up DJing in Chicago back then? So I started as, so in, in, first of all, in Tokyo, where I was uh, for junior high and high school, um, back in the 80s, you know, they sold whiskey and vending machines. And as a 15-year-old kid growing up in Tokyo, <laughs> you could go to clubs. And so it, it was a thing. And so, so I was spinning at parties and stuff from junior high. I wasn't very particularly good, but I was, I was doing that. And so... So when I got to college in uh, the States, and I was first at Tufts and then later here at University of Chicago, I was a little bit further ahead than the average college kid in, in, in sort of knowing how to do parties and be a DJ. Um, and so I was, I was spinning records at, at parties for, um, for colleges. And then when I got, and then I, I'll do the short version, but when I ended up starting hanging out at the Smart Bar, there was an amazing DJ named Mark Stevens. And, uh, um, he was he was he was sort of my guru, and he I would just spend all my time in the DJ booth, and um, he would he sort of taught me everything. And he was a, a, a Billboard DJ, and he was he just knew everything about music. And so he actually uh, started letting me mess around on the turntables, and was teaching me everything. And then eventually got me a job at the Limelight, which used to be here for anybody who was here a long time ago. So I became a regular DJ at the Limelight, but then I'd come here after the Limelight to hang out. And then when the, whenever there were extra spots or free nights, I'd, I'd spin here. So I, off, I always boast that I used to be a DJ at the Smart Bar, but I didn't have a regular slot here. I was actually a, a limelight DJ that spun here when I could. <laughs> and um, what do you think you learned from DJing? Because DJing is a really interesting art, right? So yeah, anything you can share there? Well, well so I think every, well, there are lots of different types of DJs, and they're all very different. The, the, being a DJ back then, and it may be similar now in certain venues, but here, or even at the Limelight, you would start at like 5 p.m. and you'd go all night, and then you'd keep going after you close. But it was it was like five to five, you know. And and so, and the other thing was you had regulars, so you had people who would come here almost every day. So you couldn't play the same music all the time. So and and I think Mark had like a thousand records in the. The DJ booth. So, so you would sit and you would really study. We would listen to 300 s songs a, a month, and we would stay up all night and listen to each other's music and stuff like that. But the key thing was that that I learned about was so there was a phone in the DJ booth here that was connected to the phone at the bar, and what they would do is they would say, they would call you and they say you know get more people on the dance floor, and then they'd be all and he says all right they're they're good and hot and sweaty get them over to the bar. And you slow them down, and then you could say, you know, hey, the, the, those 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 kids that look like they're from university, I think they're a bit drunk. Get them out of there. So, and you could do that by playing different music. So you put on Ed Meinster's and Big Bogman, and a whole bunch of people would leave. And then you know, you 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 you'd put, you'd play hip hop in another group. So you could actually, together with the manager at the bar, you could double sales or not, or or shut the place down or get it going, really based on the music. And so, what I realized. First of all, and it also set the culture, right? So we were always pushing people to their limits. So you get people on the dance floor and you start playing stuff that they were uncomfortable with. 
And if they trusted you as a DJ, because there's a, there's a lot of science that shows that like, you are more likely to like a song that you've heard before in a genre you don't like than a song that you've never heard before in a genre you do like, because you like the familiar. But if you have an amazing DJ like Mark, and he plays a song and it feels uncomfortable, but you know that you're gonna love it next month after you've listened to it a few times. And so what you get when you have a great dance floor with a great DJ is you get people who are adventurous, who are gonna go and dance to a song they've never heard before and they're all gonna get excited because, and there's also this thing where we would break, like all these bands would, would first get chartered by Mark. Like Fine Young Cannibals got chartered by Mark and they write a big thank you in Billboard. So people would come here to feel like they were at the cutting edge of music culture. So, so, so all of that, when I go to places like the Media Lab, I realize that, look, I'm just in charge of the background music, which is a lot, right? So I can get people to be, behave certain ways, I can get people in, get out. I, don't, I sometimes literally play the music, so I DJ, but, <laughs> but more, it's metaphorically, by sort of changing the culture of the lab, I can change yeah. the behavior of the people. Like, yeah, you're, you're setting an environment that is t leaning people towards a certain type of behavior. I also like the fact that you're, yeah, you're, you're navigating between the familiar and the unfamiliar. You're, you're pushing people, but not pushing them so much that they go to the bar or leave, metaphorically. But you're, but you're not just giving them the same old thing. I think it's a fantastic thing. So I was a music journalist when you were doing this, and I knew lots of DJs, and they're all still DJs, albeit sort of, sort of chubbier and sadder. <laughs> um, um, but you did not stay as a DJ, so can you tell, tell me anything about your journey from here to the Media Lab? So, I was here, well, the, I don't know how, how much story you want, but, but one story that, since I'm in Chicago, so I was here, and I moved to, well, first of all, my mom said, okay, I know you dropped out of college to be at this nightclub because you're learning about community and arts, and I get it, I get that you get- This is like, your mom. My mom, <laughs> right. yeah. Because maybe that you've looked, a year and a half is enough, maybe you should come to Tokyo and help me with some of the stuff that we're doing. And so I moved to Tokyo, but the first thing I did is, I want to start a nightclub. So I came back here and I found uh, Bobby Bartolo and Ivona and Michael Hecker and people from the Smart Bar, and I wanted to bring them to Tokyo. And I went to Joe Shanahan, who's still the owner here, and I said, can I borrow 10,000 bucks? I think it was 10,000 bucks. I'm pretty sure it's 10,000 bucks. And then I borrowed the money, got everybody going, brought them to Tokyo, ran a nightclub for a year where it was, I had a blast. Um, and, um, and, then, and then I think, it, I, I don't, Joe, I'll have to ask Joe, I think it was about 10 years later, I finally saved up enough money to come back to Joe and said, can you forgive me, I'm gonna pay you back. He did hit me up with a lot of interest, but I paid him back. Um, but but, but, but for, for me, the, going from being kind of a, well, I'll, I can t tell a story if you want more, but like finding this community, which was really the first real community that I felt like uh, sort of brought me in and had the diversity and the love, and it was, it was during the AIDS crisis in the 80s, so there was a lot of, a lot of support for people sort of across, you know, across communities, and um, so I learned a lot about community, and then I, I did the nightclub thing in Japan, but then I started an events company, and I started promoting Wax Track Records in Japan, I started doing television, but in parallel I was learning a lot about computers, and so I really was sort of focused on the convergence of computer networks and entertainment and media and community. So that was my main thing. And I started building and investing in a lot of companies that sort of in, were involved in that. Um, and then the Media Lab thing is sort of random. I mean, it was just, um, I can tell you more about that, but that happened six years ago. I never thought I'd, I'd be there. No, I, actually, I'd love to hear that, because how do you get arguably the coolest job in the field of creativity randomly? Just asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, so I have a kind of disability, I think, where um, my, my, my sister and I grew up with parents that sort of supported us pretty much equally. She got straight A's, magna cum laude, Harvard, Stanford, two PhDs, and I got kicked out of kindergarten. I, 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 could, I could barely study, you know, and my affliction is that I, I just can't sit and learn something unless I think I'm gonna be able to use it for something that I'm excited about right now. And so, and my sister 
weirdly got her PhD in, in anthropology and education. And she looked over at me and she's like, how can this uneducated thing um, actually have a job? And then she realized, and so she spent the next few years identifying my affliction, she calls it sort of interest-driven learner, and she's been trying to figure out sort of a methodology to help those people, because there's a lot of people in the world that don't do well in traditional education. Um, but anyway, so, so, but as an interest-driven learner, you, you, what you do is you just go from passion to passion to passion, and so I worked in movies, I worked as a DJ, I worked in a pet shop, I worked in, you know, just every kind of possible job. But you get, I would just get excited about anything. So I would get excited about science, I'd get excited about the arts. And at the beginning it's really hard, because none of this stuff sticks, you don't really get really good at anything. Um, but as you get older, what happens is you start to get pattern recognition, and you start to be able to apply these things together, and you start to be able to connect people across things. And so by the time the Media Lab was looking for a new director six years ago. Um, I had sort of done all kinds of stuff, but I had a pretty broad network. And so there's an a alum of the Media Lab, um, Megan Smith, who was a CTO of the White House until recently. And so she and I were friends from back in Tokyo. We were on a bus together in, um, in uh, Ox going from Oxford to Cambridge University, and she turned over and, and she was texting with the founder of the Media Lab, Nicholas Negroponte, and I said, how'd you like to be the director of the Media Lab? And I said, that sounds great, and, and, which is what I always say when somebody asks me, how would you like to X, Y, Z? So, um, so, but then later I got an email saying, well, you shouldn't apply because you're, you have no degree, you, you, don't, you don't have the credentials, it probably wouldn't work. But then, like, I think it was like three to six months later, they had gone through several hundred candidates and hadn't found one. And so they're scraping the bottom of the barrel and they were like, hey, remember that guy? And so they invited me in. And, and then for two days, I just had, these amazing meetings with faculty and students, and what turned out to be my disability, which is I'm interested in everything, where if you're in a lab that's trying to do everything, right, so synthetic molecular biology, robots, cryptography, um, everything, um, that everybody I met I was interested in and I was excited about, and faculty tend to be excited when you're excited about what they're excited about, and, and, and also if you come from traditional academia, you tend to have a discipline. So people are going to look at you as being somewhat biased towards that discipline. And so I think the fact that I was now, by then, smart enough to be able to at least make my way through a conversation in any field. And then, because I also didn't have my own research, so I wasn't competing with them. And I loved sort of, and, and the other part of the media lab, it's, 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 it's supported by companies. So I also love working with companies, and so, so, so it kind of fit. And then I tried it. I think a lot of people thought I would be gone after a year or two, so they were like wait, trying to wait me out. And six <laughs> years later, I'm still there, and I think they're like, okay, I, I guess we gotta deal with this guy. So um, I, I read the, the journalist Stephen Levy. Um, he described the Media Lab as the smarty pants citadel of digital creativity. Uh, I just, which sounds sort of amazing, but I, <laughs> I wonder, given your background, how did it feel to be inside this storied academic institution was the, of MIT? Was there anything which you felt yourself kicking against? Because it's pretty different to the sort of diverse, down and dirty world of, of a nightclub. Yeah, so the Media Lab itself was kind of this oddball institution inside of MIT. Yeah. Um, and, and MIT itself fancies itself as somewhat of an oddball institution in that it's very practical, there are all these hacks, and there's this kind of hacker culture there. Um, and so it wasn't nearly as weird as I thought it would be, and yeah. that the DNA of the Media Lab was some cross between the nightclub scene and the internet scene that I had been in. Um, Having said that, the stuff they were working on was much harder than it, more scientific than it had ever worked in, in molecular biology and 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 and, uh, and you know and, and computer science that actually required math, you know. And so, but um, but for me it was it, it was it was great because um, uh, the, getting back to the, the the community thing, the key thing that I felt like I needed to work on was um, the, the 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 culture. Right, and, and so, and that, that I knew, I was confident. The first thing I did was start doing, um, and turning the night, media lab into a nightclub once a month. I mean, that was that, that I knew how to do. But, but then it got, but, and then, but, 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 but until about last year though, I, I kept hidden inside of the media lab because it was its own little, little enclave, maybe back, I guess about three years ago. But recently, I think MIT itself has started to 
accept us as a part of its culture, and then I'm starting to now dig into MIT culture. Um, having said that, we just did a, this disobedience prize where we're trying to reward people for disobedience. Um, that got a couple of raised eyebrows at the MIT level, so I am starting to understand sort of where the, the, the walls of this um, Truman Show are, where I, I need to make sure I stay within my world, but... And obviously, just like with DJ, you're going to skip along that edge. Yes. Okay. So I want to come back to the disobedience prize, but I mean, first of all, I, I think that point about culture is fascinating, and it seems to be more and more, whether it's institutions like Facebook and Google or, or academic institutions, everybody's starting to pay more attention to creative culture. So I'm curious to know what what levers did you pull to shift the culture, and how did you feel you wanted to push it? So it already had really good. DNA in the culture from the very beginning. So when Nicholas Negroponte and Jerry Wiesner, who was the president of MIT at the time, set it up, they locked in uh, a really in important point, which to me was related to this, which uh, here, which was um, a, an embracing of diversity and embracing of the other. So you had, you had, you know, the founding fathers or founding families. So Muriel Cooper was an amazing designer, and you had Seymour Papert, who was this very radical thinker in learning, and you had. Marvin Minsky, who was the father of AI, but it was kind of the place where all the misfits would go. And the, the, an example of this is, so Nicholas is still pretty active at the Media Lab. We were looking for a new professor slot called Professor of Other. And we, we said one of the requirements is you have to be anti-disciplinary. So if you can do whatever you want to do in an existing discipline, don't apply. You had to be proficient in two orthogonal fields. and. Um, um, and we were looking, and we found a candidate that seemed pretty good, and everybody's excited. And then Nicholas said, "That's not other, that's another." You know, and and the and the, the idea that you would not want another one of you that you are always looking for that other, right? And and most communities you're afraid of other, you want a, another's, and that was also what was cool here about Metro. Just to tie it back, I mean, I when I first came. I was just sort of a student looking for more diversity, sort of wandering around. And Keith uh, Richards, who was a bartender here, but also a, a drummer, he just saw me wandering around, some weird little Asian kid, and grabbed me and took me all over the place and introduced me to everyone and took me around through the rest of Chicago and completely absorbed me into this community. And and there were skinheads and goths and you know, and 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 and. And it was just this, this really interesting thing. And so, so for me, it's, it's the embracing of diversity as a thing. Yeah. And, then, um, and, and, then, and then the other part, we can talk about disobedience uh, again later, but I call it disobedience robustness. So, so as an institution, like Joe here loves it when like, people do crazy things, as long as it's responsible. Now, what's responsible here and what's responsible at MIT are slightly different. Um, but, but similarly, I think questioning authority, thinking for yourself in a responsible way is how science moves forward, that's how new ideas come out, and that an institution has a kind of confidence to be able to allow people to question you and to have that critical discussion is really important, but you have to do it in a playful way because sometimes laughing is the only way you can get out of somebody kind of proving you're wrong, you know? I love that point about diversity, because people sometimes talk about diversity as a, as a moral thing, like, hey, we ought to embrace diversity, which is true, but, but I like this point that actually this is more in order to be creative, you need to be diverse. And speaking as a sort of five-year, four-year dweller in Chicago, one of the things that's really struck me here is, is people's openness and willingness to em embrace people from different backgrounds. Can, Can I just say one thing about that? Yeah. Because it, it, it will sound like I'm playing to the home crowd, but you, I promise that you can ask anybody that's ever asked me this question what my, where my favorite city is, is this Chicago. And, to, and, and just to, to explain why is this, this weird thing that Chicago has, in my view, is that um, it's not so big that it's touristy. So like, and, and again, I, initially it was from the point of view of a DJ, but like I would go to New York and they would play top 40 music and all the people in the restaurants and all the people in the clubs were just tourists. So the people who were servicing were servicing them as if they would never see these people again. And the quality of things were that way. And there weren't these persistent relationships. Chicago has this, like, it's a very large local town. So you have tourists, but the primary customer here 
are the locals, right? And the locals, though, there are enough of them so that you get all the weirdness and the diversity that you would get from big city. Yeah. But it's not so weird like San Francisco where people try so hard to be weird that you can't be weird anymore. There's like, <laughs> like, like the reason, the reason house music started here and in Detroit is because you, you need some sort of stuffy pressure to create a subculture. So there's also enough stuffiness here so that the punk rock subculture actually has purpose. In San Francisco, if you're punk, it's like everyone's punk, you know. So, 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 to me, there was like this sweet spot here for like this cultural, like outsiderness, insider thing. And so, anyway, I just, but I, I think there's something special, and I think that right now, as we're swinging back from this kind of exuberance of the West Coast, yeah. um, and I think that there's this sort of somewhat working class styled industrial internet thing of reality that there, I think you know Boston is trying to do that, but I think that there's a there's there's something cool here. Yeah. 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 Okay, now let's talk about the ways in which Chicago sucked. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Weather. Okay. Actually, I, I, uh, now, I know you're a fan of that William Gibson quote, saying the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. And um, I just, I'd love to know, in your opinion, what are some places you're seeing where the, where the future is happening? Give us some futurism. Yeah, so I, every year, I think every year, we are sending students to Shenzhen. And Shenzhen is just, Shenzhen is, is the Silicon Valley for hardware. But you go and there are factories everywhere. And first of all, they'll never say they can't make anything. And um, how, do I have time to tell a story? Like if you go, if you go to the market, there's these piles of phones. And they're old phones, they're st phones that you chuck out, brick phones. And there's these guys that sit there and they sit in M McDonald's with like a hamburger in their hand. They're, they're picking the, the, the chips off of the phones and flicking them into little bins. And then what they do is they take those into the market, they, t they test them, and then they, they put them on these reels. So if you know what a, an SMT machine is, which is a, a thing that puts the chips onto the um, printed circuit boards, they, they take these chips on reels and they load them in and then they place them. So, so what they do is they take all these old parts from thrown away iPhones, they put them back all onto reels, and then they take the boards, and also they, like if, if you have a, a sheet of circuit boards, if one is bad, they'll throw the whole sheet off, and then the guys will pick it out of the trash and just take the ones that work. And so if you go to this place, there are iPhones in every stage of, of um, development. And then all the store, all the m manufacturers who um, make iPhones, they'll run out of a part. So they'll go to the market, grab a reel, which is all off of your dead iPhones. They'll stick them back into their factory and start the factory again. So in all of your phones, I would bet you have parts from phones that have been junked and recycled. And you would never know that you go there. And then, so that's sort of phase one of weirdness. And then the second thing is, they, well, they have the schematics of every phone, right? So then the kids work in the factories. Then they make their own phones that look like all kinds of stuff. And they're using the chips and they're using all this stuff. And so they're making new phones like kids in Silicon Valley make apps, right? And, and, but then now they're innovating on and building all these new things. So when I send my students to the factories, and, and you think of Chinese factories like they're, maybe these people are, and some of the factories are bad, but the, the wonderful ones, the owner, and the, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump around, but the reason I love this place is that the owners from the very beginning were always here. Right, and, and, and Joe is a DJ. And, and the, the cool thing also about Chicago, just broadly, is it helps when it's a, you have the pricing so that you, if you worked hard enough as a bartender, you could save up money and, and then start your own club. Yeah. Shenzhen, it's kind of, the, the, the factory guys, the owners live in the, re, the factories, they eat with all the factory workers, and I, we would sit around, I've been there, and we're eating, we're talking, we're nerding out, and there's this young woman who just moved from a textile factory to the semiconductor factory, and she's talking to one of our students about how to do surge protection, and, and she's learned a lot of this just working in the factory. And so the factory floor, the ones that we go to, is like, they're like schools, they're like communities, they're all friends. They, they don't you buy fake iPhones, because they make a lot of money, and they don't have to even buy clothes or food. And so, so it's, it's, 
the image that you have of like Chinese factories is totally different. But anyway, so, so, so when you go to Shenzhen, it's just like nowhere else on earth, but, but there are others, but that's one of my favorite places. I love that story, and I, I love your point that we've been taught this narrative of a, it's almost like a victim narrative. Oh, they're poor, you know, they're all having to make our phones, but the idea that actually it's a place of learning and innovation and empowerment, that's, that's a great story. God, I'm about 4% through my uh, list of questions here. Can we do a speed round? This is just... Yeah, I'm not very good at these, but... Okay. okay. Um, I, I, is... I usually end up with the last thing I thought of rather than the most important Okay, I've got, I got, I, I got three things um, that are going on in, in the media lab, which I pretend I know about but actually don't, and I was hoping you could fill me in quickly. Um, blockchain and the Digital Currency Initiative. Yeah. Why should we be excited about that? So the blockchain is... Uh, like the internet in that I think it's a really important way to connect um, things like assets. But and, and Bitcoin is like email and it's the killer app that's getting blockchain going. Yeah. And I won't go into the details, but it's going to do to banks what the internet did to media and stuff like that. It really allows, like, like just an example would be, it would allow a musician to be paid directly from the browser of a user, or it would allow, uh, you know, contracts and all kinds of things to, to be electronic. The my main warning, and the reason we're doing it at the Media Lab, is that the internet. We had about 20 years to fiddle around and get it right as just a hobby before a bunch of people started investing money and the carpet bagger showed up. And um, Bitcoin is the, the technology and the standardization is is like 1990. And they're investing as if it's 1997. So, so we're building these fintech ventures on top of what I would think is a little tiny island of quicksand, and they're waiting for it to harden. I think we're in a bubble where every and everybody's trying to do it for money. And at the media lab, what we're trying to do is to do it to get it right first. And so I'm a little bit worried that um, there's too much excitement. So I think that law, this is called Amira's law, and Amira's law is that everybody over-anticipates the short term and under-anticipates the long term. And it always happens, but in this case, it's a little bit hardcore, and I think we're going to get what, my title of my book, so Whiplash. You sort of, yeah. yeah, you get that sort of that hype curve thing as yeah. well. Thank you for that. Okay, um, synthetic neurobiology. Synthetic neurobiology. <laughs> so, um, so, so Ed Boyden, uh, who's the youngest winner of the Breakthrough Prize, um, he invented a, a co-invented a, a, a technique called optoneurogenetics. So, it takes, um, it takes uh, 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 these uh, uh, short gene sequence from different um, organisms and uses a virus to transfer that to your neurons. And so by shining light on your neurons, um, you can either fire a neuron or dampen a neuron. So one use of it is, we've shown this with mice and we're going to start applying it with humans, is if you put those onto a, a blind person's, a certain category of blind person's retina, it will they can then see, because suddenly the light is firing their neurons when they didn't have the cones. Um, you can put it in parts of the brain and just excite or dampen uh, certain elements of the brain. So you could stop an epileptic seizure, or you could, instead of dousing your whole brain in uh, antidepressants, you could theoretically find those neurons that need to fire in order for you to get the serotonin effect, and just surgically just boom. And, and then you could do it non-invasively. So, so that's one of the things. But it's basically how do you understand and f f like fiddle with your brain, but at a very sort of um, uh, 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 precise level. Wow. So in when in nightclubs, instead of taking drugs, we'll just have a little skull cap. So, so one, of my, one of my students actually is doing his PhD thesis, and he's almost done, which means he may have gotten somewhere with it, um, <laughs> is that it's a, it's a hallucinogenic display. So by using some sort of electronic induction, he wants to be able to get you to see things. Um, and the, you know, the, the getting all of the uh, approvals to do the testing has been difficult. But, um, <laughs> but, but, it, is, but it is well known that, that, that you can induce things that feel exactly like hallucination using um, different types of electromagnetic induction. And what he's been trying to do is to control it so that the hallucinations are actually um, uh, media. And uh, so, so we, we'll see how commercializable it is, but he's working on that. Wow, I love that. Okay, the third and final one of my speed round, uh, fecal transplants and the microbiome. Yeah, yeah. microbiome. So um, this is a big fad, so a lot of people probably know about it, this, but, but it turns out that your, your gut has um, a, a lot of bacteria, 
and it is our gut is one of the most um, uh, 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 biologically dense um, uh, uh, places on the planet and so when you human beings can go in all kinds of weather but your guts always around the same temperature it's always providing food and so for the bacteria in your gut um, you, you're a great little starship and it turns out that the bacteria in our bodies have um, had a lot of co-evolution and a lot of the neurotransmitters that we use are used by the gut so you have more serotonin in your gut than you have in your brain there's a lot of evidence these days that show like for instance women's breast milk has a a, a molecule that you can't metabolize but your gut bacteria do and then they metabolize it and eat that and create something that you need so you're actually a life support system for your gut and there's a lot of hypothesis and some interesting evidence that shows that a lot of your emotions come from your gut and you can sort of sense that we talk about talking from the gut okay so there are theories like for instance chocolate it could be that the reason you like chocolate is not because you need it but it's because your bacteria need it but then they give you something you want but what's interesting it, it becomes is that if you imagine the human from the perspective of your bacteria you're like their starship, um, and you control the thing to do what you want. We might be just life support systems for, for bacteria. It could be that we kiss because we want to transfer things. It could be that we eat meals together because we're just sharing bacteria. There's a lot of theories, but, but, but the interesting thing is that your gut is actually going back to community. It's, it's a colony, and I'll get to fecal transplants. So, so, so it, turns out, it turns out that um, a really difficult uh, uh, problem that people get is there's a certain bacteria called C. diff and it's a when you take lots of strong antibiotics and you only have C. diff it goes wild and then it gives you sorry this is gonna get not a great pre-dinner conversation but <laughs> you get such bad diarrhea that no other bacteria can colonize and it gives you irritable but now so what they used to do is just give you more antibiotics and you would just suffer and suffer and suffer it turns out if you take healthy people's poop and you stick it in, the C. diff still is there, but in 90% of the time, it just gets pushed to the side. It's kind of like having a, a bunch of crazy people in a nightclub. If you fill the nightclub with other random crazy people, those people can't be disruptive anymore because they just sort of melt into the background. But if they're the only ones in your club and they go crazy, nobody else will come into the club and they will continue to be crazy. So, so the, the trick is instead of trying to hose down and eject these rowdy people from your club, you just bring a bunch of other random people into the club and then the club will settle down. So, 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 and then, you know, and, and I, so I, I led a session called ISIS and the Microbiome, which is basically if you keep bombing ISIS. It's kind of like bombing C. diff with antibiotics. They just keep getting stronger. But if you just send culture in and diversity and a bunch of love, I think it might change. And so, so it, 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 it all kind of ties together. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think you just won an allergy of the night. That's fantastic. <laughs> so, um, talking of poop, um, <laughs> One, one of the things I, I, I find really inspiring, you know, reading your work and hearing from you now, is that not only are you well informed about the future, but you're also an optimist. However, we do currently live in a somewhat poopy situation. You know, the, the, you know, whatever your political feelings, there is this, you know, there's a climate of fear, and it's it's a time of disinformation, and there's a lot of things that have got people tearing their hair out. And talking of the media lab, people are tearing their hair out about media. I just wonder. How do you think about all that as a futurist, as an optimist, as someone who's trying to promote the positive ways forward? So, so it, it ties a little bit to my San Francisco having a hard time becoming sort of culturally interesting because you can sort of do anything. I think, so, so we, I'm on the board of the Knight Foundation and we have a, a scenario planning exercise that we did. I think this might be confidential, but it's, it's fine. So, so, <laughs> so, so, so we, we envisioned like four different scenarios. And like two of them really sucked. And everybody hated it, except the arts people. They're like, you know what, in history, when it sucks, arts are good, right? And so, so, so first of all, the yeah. good news is that when it kind of gets tough out there, arts become more important, arts become interesting, music gets better. Like, yeah. you couldn't have had the punk rock movement without 
the no future generation, right? And so, 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 so one thing I think is pretty interesting to see is even at the media lab, you see kids activated, you see people coming together, you see people like the attorney general um, becoming disobedient, you see sheriffs uh, protecting um, immigrants um, and creating these these communities, uh, and, and it's just so. One thing, and, and the AIDS thing was terrible, and I would never wish any of these things. So I would never wish the world to get bad. But when the world gets bad, there's certain things that happen. And so I remember the goths and the and the you know and the and the drag queens and the skinheads getting together in a way that they would never have gotten together if they weren't we weren't going through this period. So so I think the, I'm not being optimistic, but I think the upside and the thing that I want to focus on is 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 what can we build culturally, artistically values-wise that we wouldn't be doing if we weren't sort of feeling under pressure. Um, and, but, but I also think on the flip side is that it's also a wake-up call, right? I mean, clearly the whole political system is broken and sort of trying to understand what this new world is about. I think we, and I'm, again, this is tricky because I'm also on the board of the New York Times. And so, so it's, it, you know, there's sort of the New York Times view of the world, which, which I think is important, but I think it's one slice. And, the, and there's another point of the world, view of the world, which I get more with the kids, which is it's not about left or right. It's about open or closed or out or in. And, 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 and it's a very different thing going on. And I think right now we, we, we have to deal with this thing, right? And so, so, so I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important time to be paying attention and innovating and, and doing things. And, and so, um, so I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if that's no, the question. I, 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 no, I think that's great. I love. I, this has been a common thread through this, uh, the reframe. It, yeah. It's not left or right. It, it, it's something else is shifting. And, 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 and I think we need a punk rock. I mean, I think that I don't. You know, I think Donald Trump, in his own way, is kind of punk rock. But I wouldn't want him to be the like. I don't want him to be the seditious. I think there's a there's actually a kind of punk rock that needs to emerge because I think I think we need a culture change, and I think culture change happens through music and arts. And I think the problem is like whether we're talking about climate change or we're talking about also everybody's been trying to convince people with information and with education. But if you look, real culture change, whether it it, it always comes through music and arts, right? And I, I feel like we haven't had that, and, and hopefully... It comes, comes through the gut, I think, you know, yeah, it's right. like, yeah, it's, yeah, I, mean, no, I, I mean, the emotional, I, I, it's, it's, not, it's I, not about I, I, the All head. of our behavior is sort of some conspiracy between the gut and advertising agencies. The two of them get together, <laughs> and basically, we have no self-will, free will other than... But, but you are doing, uh, uh, I said I'd come back to this, you are doing some stuff yourself to provoke change. Tell me about the Disobedience Award, because that's fascinating. A quarter of a million dollars, for being disobedient, I wish that award had been around when I was at school. But it's a uh, yeah. Tell me more about that. Well, you know, it came because I, last year, um, you know, we were doing a conference on forbidden research, um, and we met with a lot of people who were having trouble doing their research, and it reminded me of Copernicus and Galileo, and 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 and, and we don't, it's not life threatening anymore. But you can still lose your job and lose your funding. And then I had the opportunity here. And and, and 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 see John Lewis talk about the civil rights movement and and his sort of discipline in nonviolence. And my favorite story was you know how they would go to the basement of churches and they would kick each other and spit on each other. And so when he was on the freedom ride, and um, he and his friend were beaten and left in a pool of blood, um, he did he was able to stay nonviolent. And then I don't know if you know the story, but then a few years later, I think 2008. Um, he got a call, a guy said, can I come see you with my son? Because I was one of the Klansmen who tried to kill you, and I want you to, can you forgive me? And they said yes, and they hugged, and they cried. And when we asked John Lewis, you know, like, what, what, he says, like, unless you can create that forgiveness and that nonviolence, you can't bring out humanity in the other. And, and for me, what's really important is, like, a lot of the kids that I've been working with, they say, oh yeah, that Gandhi stuff, life's different now. We can't do that nonviolent stuff. Our enemy is more sophisticated. We gotta fight. We got and and I feel like that's not true. I think that you can still it's different, but you can learn from the John Lewis. And then Malala, I met her a few years ago and I've been seeing her quite regularly. She's so inspirational. She's so tough. She's not violent. And so one of the key things for this award is partially is 
this conversation that I had with my students about, um, you know, creating examples of people who are alive today, um, who who are, you know, doing things in a responsible, elegant, funny, creative way that are making a difference. And, and the award might end up with an artist. It might end up with with somebody in the government. Um, but but I will say that we we launched this award last J July before the election. Um, so right now, disobedience and protest is a lot more popular to talk about. Um, but I think it's not a new thing. I think you always have to have any healthy democracy requires dissent. Any healthy scientific system requires questioning authority. And so I think people sort of assume that you, you know, and, and laws need to be questioned. And so we just want to amplify that, but we also want to amplify the appropriate way in which to do it. Right, yeah, sort of positive, constructive disobedience as opposed to just punching people in the face. Or the, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Well, look, I would, I'd love to talk all night, but um, I now am required to throw this open to the floor to get some questions from people in the audience. So uh, I can see a hand down with Anthony. Yes. Gentlemen, uh, could you tell us about your early warning systems? How do you find out what's over the horizon? Where do you go for that kind of insight yourself? Yeah, I think, um, so the, the, the key thing is that we have about 450 projects at the lab, um, and we have about 700 people in the ecosystem, about 250 are grad students. But we don't tell them specifically what to do. And so our, our faculty are constantly trying to think of new things, but we always have a fresh uh, batch of students coming in as well. So the, whenever we're looking for faculty, we're looking for faculty that we can't imagine. So we're always trying to find that thing that we can't even imagine. And then the faculty then go out and find students and weird things that they can't imagine. And I'll say, I mean, this is actually, we're, we're really lucky because the money that we get from these companies comes in through a consortium. So it's completely undirected. So they don't tell us what to do. So I tell all of our faculty that they should be fun working on stuff that no one else would fund and looking for students that no one else would hire. And so by definition, a lot of them will be not, there's a lot of risk, but you're looking, this is, we use, we use the word anti-disciplinary, which is the space between and beyond the disciplines, but you're more likely to find something low cost and interesting to do where, because the disciplines are kind of like looking for the keys under the, the, the light lamppost point, point. And our mandate is just go out where it's, it's all very dark. Um, and, and so so that's one, and then I think we've built up over 30 years enough of a reputation so that you know we get a lot of crazy people, but we also get a lot of people who feel like we would be the place for them um, to, to try a new thing. But it's, 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 not, it's not nearly as strategic as you might think. It's, it's really about creating an environment and then allowing the students and the people who come through uh, to be fully supported, to be as um, bold as they want. And, and most of our faculty, like, Ed Boyden, who, who, who you know, won the Breakthrough Prize, um, he was trying to invent this optogenetics. And Harvard, Stanford, MIT all turned him down. He didn't have anywhere to go. So he came because they said, you're, you're, you're crazy. This is a crazy idea. And so we said, OK, well, we'll fund you and, and go for it. And, and then he, he knocked it out of the park. And so it's really by looking for people who appear to be extremely smart or extremely creative, but no one wants the support. And there are a lot of them. Great. Uh, over there. Yes. Uh, thank you for coming and the kind words about Chicago. Um, so I assume you're pro open source and free software, at least sympathetic to it. How would you like convince a traditional business to embrace open source or free software as opposed to like proprietary? What would be like the ROI argument there? Yeah. Well, you can go online and get the deep long version. But first of all, I'm adamantly open source and free software. So all of our content um, on, from the Media Lab is by default free and open, and you have to get a special you have to get special permission for me to be it, make it closed, and all of our photos are Creative Commons licensed. Um, th there's there's a lot of research that shows it, but the rough rough version of this is that um, you know you're much more likely to if you're using the software and you're developing the software, uh, free and open source software lets you adapt it. Uh, you will get the updates from the rest of the community. Um, uh, you, you're not going to be captured uh, by uh, somebody uh, who creates a proprietary system. I mean, I think 
again, it depends a little bit on, on your technical expertise of your organization, but, um, and most of the internet, by the way, runs on free and open source software, and if it weren't for free and open source software, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have Facebook, Yahoo, Google, any of these guys. And free and open source software really built um, everything that we have right now. Um, it, it does get poo-pooed because some software companies um, uh, uh, doesn't work in their business model, but, um, but if, you, if you're not convinced about free open source software, I, I urge you to go on to YouTube or Google and, and convince yourself. <laughs> um, down there. Hi, um, I work with BMO Financial Group and we're very much interested in blockchain and some of the fintech initiatives that are coming out. And I 100% agree with everything you said about fintech, but what about the regulators? Um, it seems that particularly here in the US, regulation seems to be a bit behind even where the banks are. are. Are you all doing any work or are you aware of what we can do to get the regulators kind of up to speed on what's happening in that space? Yeah, yeah we, we do a lot of work with the regulators and I think, um, to be honest, we probably get more interaction with regulators because, so, so I made a point to sell all of my shares in any companies that had anything to do with blockchain or Bitcoin before I started the, the Media Lab project because I felt it was a conflict of interest. I won't name names, but other schools, there are a lot of professors who are, almost all the professors in some schools are into startups. The problem is when you go to a regulator or like a central bank, it's important that you're not trying to sell them something or that you don't have a financial point of view. And so, so right now, a lot of the regulators are thinking about things. I think the central banks are getting pretty smart. Um, but I think it's important to, uh, because so, if you look at the internet, you have these layers where you have like Ethernet that created 3Com, and then you had TCPIP, which created Cisco, which was the biggest company in the world for a while, and then you had the web that created um, Amazon and Google. And each of those layers of open interoperable protocols were created by people like Tim Berners-Lee, who didn't patent it and who just gave it away. Oddly, TCPIP was, created by, was partially created by David Clark, who's at MIT. Um, World Wide Web was created by Tim Berners-Lee, which is at, who's at MIT. So one of the problems with MIT is we create the open standards on top of which all the people on the West Coast build their monopolies. But, um, <laughs> but, 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 the, but, but the regulators care about making sure that um, each of these layers work properly. And I think you know, it's gonna take a while, but, I, but there are a lot of really smart people. I just hired the head of digital payments from the Bank of England, Rob Ali, and he's brilliant. Um, and so we're creating a little s sort of SWAT team of people who understand this stuff. We're running around the world trying to um, uh, coordinate with everybody. But um, but if you if you want some, you, my email is on, on on the MIT website. But I can send you some of the papers that we were writing in the space. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's have a question from the balcony, uh, gentleman up there. Ah uh, yes, thank you so much for being here. This may be an overly simplistic question, but given your life experience and all the things that you're exposed to, and the fact that you know as was mentioned earlier tonight, we're somewhat in a culture of fear. I'm curious to know. What are you afraid of? What am I afraid of? That's a good question. Um, um, well, so, so there's sort of like, there's different layers of fear, right? So there's kind of like the day-to-day the -day fear of, you know, grabbing something to eat and it's not, doesn't taste good, you know? So, so well, I, I teach a class on awareness. Let's start there with, with, a, with, a, with a monk. Um, named um, Tenzin, and, and, and you get different levels of awareness. And so when you're meditating in the morning and you hear the birds chirping and you're one with everything, you have no fear, right? Like, actually, and, and Conservation International has these great videos recently that I love, it, and that it's like the ocean, and this is, nature doesn't need humans, humans need nature. You know? So if you can get to the point where, where all you care about is nature, you don't, you don't even need really humans. So, so, so if you can always transcend fear if you're sort of present. So, so it's sort of gets. I'm sorry, this is getting a little bit metaphysical, but, but like, but I do have like fears depending on at what layer I'm at. So I fear sometimes about um, the the inability for governments to talk to each other, and I think international relations are completely screwed because they're working in a pre-networked age way of thinking. So I think just the world in terms of war and death is gonna get really bad before it gets better. I think that at the national level, I think that all of the stuff that we're talking about right now, the politics, the diversity, the, 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 the ability for us to communicate with each other is also screwed up. 
and, and weird, the, the, the part that I feel horrible is I really thought the internet was just going to make the world a really happy place when I was, when I was working on it in the old days. And, and I thought when Arab Spring happened, I thought, hey, we, we did it. You know, that, that was my, I was about to do a victory lap. Um, it's not that, right? So, so just like any technology, it turns out has a bad, is having a bad day right now. And so, so my, my fear that is, is that it takes a lot longer to heal a lot of damage that we have right now. Um, so that would be like that would be categorized, I think, as a as a as a, a feeling of dread that it's going to take a long time. But I'm generally optimistic that um, we will heal and that it will get better. Um, but but I, but I don't have what what is typically I think you would call a fear is that I I think that anything bad that happens um, gives you energy to then do something good and. Actually, in fact, having bad things happening sometimes gives you the appreciation of the good things. So that, because if everything were always good, then it would be like just another day in paradise, and it'd be pretty boring. So, so I think it's okay for bad things to happen. But it kind of, but it's, but I don't like saying this in public because it's sort of an insensitive thing. Because I, I'm privileged right now. It, I, I'm fine, and there's people out there who who aren't fine, and it's not fun for them, and they're in fear. So, so, so. Personally, I don't, you know, but it's, it's, it's complicated because it's a very complex system and just like universally making something good doesn't necessarily make the system more robust in the long run. And I think robustness comes from diversity. You got to hit the thing occasionally to make sure it's awake. And so I think we're getting smacked right now and it's checking to see if we're going to react. And in fact, there are a bunch of organs that we have, institutions, ways to do things that are broken. And so why don't we fix these? In, while, while we're just sort of rattled around being shocked. Um, but instead of turning, it's, I guess, sorry, let me just say one thing. This is a Marshall Gantz quote, which is great. Is when something happens and you, 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 you go into fear, um, that turns into violence and anger. Um, but if you can turn that into a challenge, it pulls people together. So I think what the trick, I think, is to instead of taking these attacks on some of our rights and things as something that we need to fear, but take it as a challenge to us to come together to oppose, that will actually make us stronger. So maybe that's the key thing would be, the moment, whenever I feel fear, I try to turn that in my head to, hey, wait, I'm being challenged to do something. I love what you're doing there, sort of fear judo. Yeah. <laughs> um, do we have anybody up there with a question? But we do down here. Yes. Hello. I, uh, I consider you sort of a patron saint of curious, committed generalists. And in that context, I'd like to ask, not just on behalf of all the young people here, but for all of us who deal with this, I would love to hear you riff a little bit about what it is to design a life and a purpose when you don't have a very clear thing calling you in a straight line trajectory like is so encouraged and nurtured in our culture. So, so I would start this with the caveat that I think everyone's very, very different. And I also hate when like, you know, I won't name names, but some famous billionaire gets up and tells their life story and says, well, just do what I did and you'll be a billionaire. And it turns out there's 99 people who did the same thing who weren't as lucky, right? So, so I, I can give you my impression of what I think, but I don't think it applies to everyone and I don't think it applies to most people even. So you should just take it if it, if it resonates. But, um, and like I said, I was an interest-driven learner that really had sort of ability to sort of jump out in bursts of energy when I was focused on something. So instead of turning that into, because I think if my parents weren't tolerant, they would have sent me to, you know, remediate me and to make me, like my dad tried to do that. He made me read X pages every night and I would pretend to read pages and I would daydream. And so, so, so I think one of the keys for parents, first of all, is try to not remediating your kids. There's this, this news story I saw recently, and I can't remember the name of the person, but it was some kid who, who was being treated as an autistic kid, and their parents were told that they would never learn to read and write and be a normal human being. It turned out he was a physics genius, slightly autistic. She, she mom took him out of school, re, le, unleashed him on himself, and then now he's coming up as a teenager with theories that no one has even um, 
been able to imagine in physics. And so, so I really think everybody needs to find the method of learning and the passion path. And some people have like one passion for their whole life. I had like a passion minute when I was a kid and then later it got down to like a, a per year cadence. And now I've been able to, for the first time, hold a job for more than two years and, and love it. And now I feel like actually I'm gonna be here forever, which is a long time. Um, but, 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 but because I can vicariously live through all these kids who come in every two years, and so I've figured out a way to scale my, uh, my short attention span. Um, but but, but, I, but, I, but I, I, I think a lot of it comes from the support of the, of, of the parents. I think that's really important. If you can't get it from your parents, you get it from mentors. That was my second most important innovation when I was growing up, was I learned that um, like the guy, the tropical fish store guy, had something that I wanted to learn, or this other person had something I wanted to learn. And what I realized is that like almost everybody had something to teach you, and if you could figure out what that was, you would, and, and again, this has sort of turned out to be salesy, but it was sort of very earnest, honest. But you, you say, hey, you know, that's the th that thing that you do. Can you teach me? And a lot of times, the, the adult will not, ha oh, wow, you notice that I'm good at that. And, and, and then they will really obsessively teach you and, and mentor you. And I think learning to identify in anybody the thing that, that they have that you want to learn. And so I learned a lot from adults, and, and the mentors were really helpful in in nudging me and also giving me confidence. Because I think there's a great book by and I, the IDEO Kelly Brothers about creative confidence, right? Which is the confidence to be creative. And, and one of the things that I noticed was when you're little in school, they smash that out of you, right? So, so like if you're sitting around in a bathtub on a weekend and you come up with an idea, if you've destroyed your creative confidence, you're gonna say, you know, somebody's already thought of that. Um, this is probably not a new idea. And you go off and get a beer and watch TV. If you have a lot of creative confidence, you say, holy shit, maybe I'm inventing something new. Oh my god, what if this is like this? And then you spend the whole day tinkering, and it may or may not be true, but that moment of deciding to pursue this thing or not. So like our students are on a mailing list, and I'll see them talking about something. By the evening, they built it. And by the next day, they've deployed it. And then they'll be sharing the plans for it to other schools on the mailing list. That energy to actually, like, pull through and complete an idea. Um, that has a lot to do also with the community and the reinforcement that you get. But you can also make sure that you, you, you do it to yourself. And, and I think that, that just that idea of, wait, I'm not good enough, wait, I'm not smart enough. Like when we, one, I'll just tell one last story, which was we did a, a workshop with IDEO in Detroit, and it was a bunch of our students. And, um, um, and we went to East Detroit in a pretty tough area. and. Um, a bunch of interesting things, but like one of the things was like our students were working with, with these these kids, and one kid who you know was he made designer made T-shirts, but but he came up and he goes, you know, I was sitting next to an MIT kid, and my idea won, you know, and and then the MIT kids were like, wow, I didn't, we came in with all these crazy ideas about how we could help Detroit, but they were all wrong. But once we worked with the kids, and the other folks there, they came up with such cool ideas, and and what we realized after we left, and I've gone back to the community. Those kids are now um, doing all kinds of amazing things. And, 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 and this is, to me, the lesson that I learned also um, coming here to the Metro was all the kids that were here were working class kids. And all the kids that I was going to universities, they may have had working class parents, but they clearly didn't think they were going to end up being working class, right? So, but what I got was a really healthy respect for not only the, 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 the culture of, but the intelligence of working class people and and I think this is a two-way thing too because I think what happens to a lot of overeducated people is they lose their creative confidence when they realize that they've been educated but they don't know what they're talking about and then there's the opposite that happens which is the working class person who doesn't have confidence because they because you know they're being shed on by you know some educated person who thinks they know what they're doing and and that mixing also is really important and, and I think you can do that as a community, but you can also do that as a, as a per individual or as a parent. But but that dispelling that fear, and, and again, it was pretty weird for me trying to get a job at MIT without a college degree, but, but I think that also, for the Media Lab, gives everyone a little bit of permission to be, you know, confident regardless of their background. I've just realized that I have one more question, and it is a fashion question. And uh, I'm wondering if you could tell us the story of that jacket. Or oh, this jacket. So um, this is a smart bar jacket um, that the staff wore here back 
in the 80s. Um, Can you show the back of it, by the way? It's pretty spectacular. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I wanted one really badly. <laughs> and, um, and Mark, who was uh, uh, the, the, the DJ at the time, my, my, my mentor, um, I can't remember exactly what it, things are a little bit blurry back then, but <laughs> but, um, but, I, but I think it had something to do with like me trying to take his jacket, and then him realizing that he should just get me one, and so he got me this. But I've been but but it mean it was like, it's, it's good. It's thirty years old. And it's still and, I, and actually I, I wear. It, but that's yeah. Well, look, um, we are out of time. This has been incredibly inspiring for me personally. I think for the audience too. So, Joey, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.